Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about Temeraire by Naomi Novik. Okay, who wants to do the terrible summary? Uh, my terrible summary is, yeah, I've had this dragon for a day and a half, and if anything happened to him, I would kill myself and everyone on this boat, and then myself. Um, <laughs> you know, the second book is basically that, but like Temeraire for Lawrence. Oh, <laughs> just, I've had excellent. this naval captain for like a year and a half, and if anything happened to him... <laughs> I will burn the entire world. Yeah. Um, the one thing I wanted to say before we actually really get into this episode is, mm. read this book. Everyone should read this book. Mm -hmm. You're only allowed to listen to this podcast episode if you have read this book because you should read it and you should read it without being spoiled. So you're not allowed to listen to this episode until you've read it because we're going to spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler alert. We cannot uphold this law, but... (laughs) Yeah, we can't force you, but you should. You should read it. (laughs) This is a book that Em has been... Uh, recommending to me for ages also every single person that i know people <laughs> if we were still getting buses it would i would be recommending it to random strangers on the bus <laughs> we've reached that level i love it so much and it's another one that yes has been recommended for and i've read for this podcast and absolutely love this i devoured this book i read it in about four hours it's yes. so good such a good so book good. i i think i've read this before but when i was probably like 11 I remember having the book <laughs> somewhere in in my house, but I couldn't find yeah. it. So I guess reading it for the first time afresh. I, I kind of thought mm-hmm. it was basically the Napoleonic Wars, but with dragons and the dragons are big cats. That was kind of the vibe I got from this this uh, this book. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, that's, I think that's that it. sums it up quite nicely. Yeah, I was trying to rack my brain and think about like why I read it because I... I knew people had recommended me Spinning Silver near constantly for about a year before I read it. Which is another book by Naomi Novik. And I kind of assumed it was to do with that. And I think what actually happened was I somebody on Tumblr mm. recommended A. Marguerite's Monstrous Regiment, which is what if Pride and Prejudice happened in this world where there are also dragons and Lizzie Bennett is a dragon captain. And that blew my entire mind. And I was like, well, I guess I have to read the original now. Mm-hmm. Um so that I got into it by reading a fanfic first, which isn't I'd like to say that doesn't happen very often, but I have been <laughs> seduced into many fandoms by reading fics that I have no context for and then being like, damn, <laughs> alright. I guess I live here now. Now I have to do the reading. Now I have to understand the lore <laughs> for this fanfic. <laughs> I guess like the, the 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 setup for this book is that it's obviously set during the Napoleonic Wars and there's the captain of this British vessel, the HMS Reliant, uh, William Lawrence, who is a babe. We love him. <laughs> and basically that there is this uh, big uh, ship battle and on the ship that they capture, there's a dragon's egg. And so I guess part one of this book is going through what they do with the egg. And then part two is the egg hatches. And then part three is big dragon does cool stuff yeah <laughs> um, in a nutshell it's ve- it's a very good introduction to the world because like will lawrence as we meet him doesn't know very much about dragons mm-hmm. like the aerial core in britain is like really secretive and so like laymen don't really know anything about dragons apart from like maybe if they've seen them in battle once or twice Mm -hmm. so like we get to it's a very like naturalistic way of introducing us to like all the ways this world is different because there are dragons Mm -hmm. and also like just establishing all the lore and like what dragons could do and and uh, how people think about them and like you have to harness them right after they're hatched otherwise they'll be feral and they'll you won't be able to use them as weapons of war essentially yeah, um, and that's like the mo- the first conflict in the book is somebody mm-hmm. has to harness this dragon, and then they're bound to the dragon, and they have to go and become an aviator. Yeah. And none of them want to because it's like this massive like feud. The navy don't like the air corps. Yeah, they're like the aviators are like not respectable. No, if you if you ride a dragon, then you're like you can't be admitted to polite society ever again, kind of mm. thing. It's this massive taboo almost and and it's kind of it there's a few mentions of saying the aviators had scruffy uniform they weren't very well kept they're very like you know windblown obviously being on a dragon but they don't stand on ceremony either or like rank yeah yeah they don't they don't do manners really 
And it's a it's a very big difference to what Lawrence is used to in the Navy, where there is a very mm. strict command structure. It's all very organi- organized in the sense of your like your mm. clothing and like in uh, hierarchy. And his boat gets this egg. The egg hatches, and they mm. call the dragon uh, Temeraire. Yeah. And well, so that he and his crew like draw lots to see who has to be the one to make the sacrifice of trying to harness this dragon, right? Yeah. And the person who drew the lot, which is not Lawrence, um, mm. basically fails to do it. Mm-hmm. And then the dragon comes up to Lawrence and, and starts talking to him, and it's like, oh, yeah. I guess this dragon has adopted me. Yeah. Also, I want to say I wanted to talk about that moment because I think it's a really. So I was rereading this. This was maybe my fourth time around because this is how much I love this book. And I was kind of reading it with an eye to like character things because I've got a fic in my head that I want to write that is like very long Will Lawrence character study, basically. And I was thinking about how it's such a good introduction to his character. But like the key moment when he harnesses the dragon, I want to talk about because like. I think that kind of establishes everything you need to know about him. Yeah. It's like for the whole, like since they've had the egg, he's been doing this whole like, oh, I don't want to be an aviator, but I can't ask my men to do it if I'm not willing to take the risk. And that's why like they end up drawing lots, right? And he's still wrapped with guilt over it because the kid that pulls the short straw is like a terrified of heights and yeah. really young and has like his whole life ahead of him, all of this. And so the dragon comes up to Lawrence and like after refusing to be harnessed by this poor kid, and is like, hey, why? what's with the long face, man? Why the long face? <laughs> um, only cuter than that, obviously. Yeah, um, <laughs> he asks, why are you frowning? I think. Yes. And um, Lawrence sees the kid coming up with the harness again, like desperately trying to master himself to like try again and mm. ruin his whole life, basically, because it's his duty. And Lawrence just takes this deep breath and goes, I beg your pardon, I did not mean to. And suddenly he's the dragon captain. And mm-hmm. but it's like it's very clear in that moment that he's choosing that to save somebody else from it. Yeah, yes. and I think that tells you everything you need to know about him going forward. Basically, and they can't just let the dragon go feral. Somebody has to harness it because it's so yeah. valuable to have a dragon that they need it to become an mm. actual dragon they can use to fight and not just to breed more dragons. And yeah. one of the things is because the backstory of this is like most of the officers in the navy at the time came from, I guess, landed gentry aristocracy Mm. like the sons of like some lord Mm -hmm. somewhere Mm. therefore being kicked out of society is bad for like your social standing but it's also conflicts Mm. with your family um which i think em you wanted to talk about about that his yeah can we talk about lawrence's parents (laughs) his dad sucks his dad sucks so much i know like Mm. the setup is basically tamara decides to take lawrence and they go back to england and uh, Lawrence's like, oh, on the way to Scotland, where they're going to train for the Air Corps, he wants to meet is his Is it where their magic school is? It's where their fake yeah. dragon Hogwarts is. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's better because <laughs> it's got dragons. And yeah, he goes to his parents and his parents are dicks. Hogwarts has well, dragons? <laughs> haven't you read book three? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But not like, you let's know, not, let's, yeah. you're not training a dragon. <laughs> but um, yeah, so he goes home and... I don't know what you guys thought, but I, I I did make a note that actually a bit of it is some of the language is lifted out of Pride and Prejudice. I mean, it's the same time period. Like, yeah. that's what they're aiming for, yeah. Um, and his discussion with his childhood sweetheart is like, oh, will you take me? Will you marry me? And she's like, nope, you're an air, air call now. <laughs> yeah. Leave me alone. Yeah. And his, yeah, his dad ran away. Uh, his dad sucks. His dad disowns him for having done this duty to his country and given up a career and a potential yeah. marriage that he really well, like wanted. he disowns him in everything but actually saying he, he's like i'm not disowning you don't be ridiculous i just never want to speak to you or see yeah. you again and you can't rely on us for money or yeah <laughs> don't go around telling people that i've disowned you that would give me a bad name but i have disowned you but you can't say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of get the impression that their relationship was already already pretty terrible because lawrence I ran know. off to join the navy against his dad's best like, wishes basically mm. he want, his dad wanted him to join the church i think or like yeah. it was considered about as bad if he had joined the church or something yeah um, it reminded me of in black sails there mm. is um homophobia in uh, in the early 1700s is a driving force in the plot of that show and that's pretty much mm. all i will say for fear of spoilers because i love black sails and i don't want to spoil mm. it but there is a there is a plot line where somebody is basically disowned and completely berated and abused by his father in a very similar scene Mm. Mm. and it's just sort of i don't know about the comparison but like you know here is somebody doing something that actually 
Lawrence has done a really good thing and yeah. uh, you know in uh, and he's just getting completely raked over hot coals from it by people yeah. who have absolutely no concept of who he is and what motivates him and yeah, mm. yeah. And it's interesting like on a on a reread it really struck me like I don't think I noticed the first time because like okay so the first time I read this I read it really fast because I was enjoying it and I didn't pick up on all the nuance but like it really struck me how like genuinely upset Lawrence is by it mm. like he's like he's not quite disassociating but he is proper like he's completely out of it and you can tell like his dad doesn't say very much but it's enough to have this absolutely devastating effect on this guy that we've already kind of established as being sort of a rock in difficult situations you know mm. you can rely on Lawrence and you know he's steady you know and and in this scene, he's just, like, completely taken apart with, like, two sentences. And he just walks... He basically walks straight out of the house and just straight into Temeraya's chest and is just like, poof, I live here now. And Lawrence is like, yeah, okay, I'm just being hugged by my dragon to sleep now. Yep. This is, this is my emotional support dragon and you can't take him from me. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did like is, like, his mum met the dragon, though. Oh, his mum's lovely. So his mum is so sweet and she goes over to meet the dragon and Temeraire is just very gentle and just like, yes, I'm a dragon. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So Temeraire been- says to her, Will, Will in, uh, Lawrence introduces her and says, oh, this is, this is so, so, she's my mother. And Temeraire goes, oh, a mother. That's special, isn't it? Because like, he's a yeah. dragon. He hatched from an egg. He doesn't know Ooh. these things. And he's just so polite and immediately yeah. he's like, this woman is clearly very important to Lawrence. Therefore, I'm going to be yeah. lovely to her. Um mm-hmm. And one of the things that this book does so, so well is just immediately establishing the relationship between Lawrence and Temeraire and yeah. giving it heart and making you believe in it without yeah. doing a lot of words to make it that yeah. way. There are like two or three moments, I think, that people like to quote that are like, and you know, the plot will be rollicking along. And it's like, you know, it's quite a plot heavy book. You know, it is very like, it's an action adventure kind of mm. situation. Mm. You do get like, you run along through it, you know? And there are two or three moments where it just stops you dead to be like, would you like to be te- completely destroyed by a moment of peak tenderness between a man and a dragon? And you're like, yes, actually, thank you, I would. I'll just sit here and sob yeah. for the rest of the chapter. Thank you and good night. <laughs> that is exactly what I ordered on this Sunday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> like From day one, when he got the dragon, he read bedtime stories to this dragon and yeah! just told him yeah. stories. And also when Temeraire was just asking dumb things like, I want to go look at that flower. I want to go look at the sky. Lawrence is a very, yeah. he's like the supportive parent of a dragon. I found a shiny rock. Look, it's a cool shiny rock. I know. It's just He's so kind to him. It's yeah. so, so kind. And I think at the start of the book, you definitely get this impression. You're thinking, oh, everyone's got to be nice to their dragon. I'm sort of segueing into the main... Oh, are we going to oh, bitch no, about Rankin? Talk about Rankin. <laughs> oh, the main <laughs> evil guy. Because you're kind of thinking, everyone's got to be nice to the dragon because this is such a cool situation. Like, we love a dragon. And like, if you, you or I had a dragon, we would be like, we'd be like with the cat, but more, right? We would just yeah. be like, this is my soulmate. I love and treasure them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am ride or die instantly. Absolutely. And then we meet characters... Who are not like that? Oh. Like what's his face, Rankin? Who uh, I was, I was, I was texting, I was messaging M as I was reading this, obviously because I'm just like reading this, having a lot of feelings, and like I need to share mm-hmm. these with somebody. Who <laughs> yeah. And I remember messaging M and being like, I don't like this Rankin dude. He has given me the bad vibes. Catherine <laughs> yeah. Harcourt hates him. Who is a, a character we'll also talk about, and she's amazing. And and therefore, I think he's. I have I have been given no solid evidence to believe this yet, but also I hate his guts. And then it turns mm. out he basically neglects his dragon. And like yeah. the bond between a dragon and its captain is is like, mm. I'm trying to think of it, it's almost like they're your demon from um, yeah. Star Materials. Yeah, like you you have to treat them well. It's it, just... what it reminds me of is kind of it mostly from fandom things is things like soulmates, mm. like soul bonds. It's mm. that kind of like the, the sense almost. that you're kind of you don't necessarily get a huge amount of choice in it and you're stuck with them. But for most most people regard that as a really good thing. Mm. Yeah. Like most, and you get like a lot of the time. I mean, or not always. Sometimes fanfic is doing soulmate things as like this is just fun and we're going to have a fun, sexy time. But a lot of the time, what it's it ends up talking about is things like free will and what it means to love somebody and to choose to love somebody, mm. and how that doesn't always work. Mm. Yeah. And I think one of the that's one of the really interesting things is that yeah, we get quite a few foils to Lawrence and Temeraire's relationship throughout this book and there's different ways like 
most dragon captains are like completely devoted to their yeah. dragons. But what that means and what that looks like... But you see it express itself in different ways. Yeah. And not all of them are. The first other dragon that we meet is this... like uh, Oh, Volley! Yeah, if we're going to compare dragons to cats, which I think we are going to do repeatedly mm. throughout this book, the discussion yeah. of this book. Like, you know a cat that you see and their eyes are just vacant and you know there is nothing going on in that It's head. just elevator music. <laughs> exactly. Sweet, that sweet that is the first music. dragon that we meet whose name is... Volatilis? Volley. Yeah, Volley. And um, because they all mostly have like sort of Latin sounding names. Yeah. Mm. And you you see that like the the person who's the the captain of this dragon is like refers to him as like a bottomless pit, like with affection in the same way that we we talk to our cat, right? We call her a mess. And yeah. um, And it's sort of established that this is uh, this is the 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 sort of the spectrum is either you know you treat your your dragon like this or you treat your dragon like Lawrence and Temera because Temera is really intelligent and they have mm. a real relationship yeah but already by the time that we meet this Rankin character it's established mm. that you do not you, you, you to treat your dragon badly is a sin of the highest order right and yeah. and at the but start, that's what he's doing I think that was quite imperative like so he goes to uh, Loch Lagan and he meets Rankin at the start because nobody's talking to Rankin. And then he, yes. and, then, and then you and he go, goes, oh, an outsider. I will befriend this outsider. And then he yeah. realizes he's an outsider for a good reason. Nobody yeah. likes him because he treats his dragon so badly that Lawrence mm. ends up a la uh, Rosa in Brooklyn Nine Nine with all the puffies, just saying, somebody <laughs> go and look. Up, I will pay you to go and look after this little dragon. He just needs company yeah. and some like positive reassurance yeah. well the dramatic irony as well yeah of lawrence seeing this dragon levitas and going why is nobody looking after this dragon what's this captain doing and like adopting this dragon basically and making yeah. sure he gets washed and making sure he gets food and company and enrichment and at the mm. same time building a friendship with rankin whose dragon he never sees mm. yeah. and you can see it coming closer and closer yeah levitas is rankin's dragon and lawrence's horror when he realizes yeah. he is being um, cultivating a friendship with this person who is despised yeah. for good reason. And can we talk about his reaction? Because I think it's really interesting and possibly mm. like, I don't know that it's necessarily a model of how you should deal with something like that, but I found it very interesting that he doesn't he doesn't try and explain himself to anybody. No. He doesn't mm. say, oh, I didn't know. Because he realizes he, sa- he could have. Yeah. yeah. He's like, he, yeah, he realizes I could have picked up on this. The evidence was here. mm and then he's like, okay, so all I can do is amend my behavior immediately and hope that people notice. But I mm-hmm. can't, like, none of it, he, he's saying I hope that people notice in the sense of, like, he wants it to be clear that he didn't he mean it and it. that, you know, that he wants mm-hmm. to, like, get on well with these people that he's come to respect. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he's not going to beg for forgiveness or he's not going to make a big thing of it. He's just going to be like, Okay, the only way I can fix this is to change my behavior immediately. Yeah. And hope that that's enough. And it was like yeah. one of those one of those moments where prior to this because in the navy he kind of he came across to me at least like being very prim and proper obeying the rules, not yes. being rude, like obeying your seniors, you know, yeah. trying not to cause an upset. And I've highlighted yeah. it, and it was any basis past the point of caring if it seemed rude. Lawrence interrupted with praise and patted Levitas. And it was just, he just yeah. goes to the point, F this, I'm going to go and pet this because I can't deal with yeah. it anymore. And screw the rules, I'm doing what's right. You know? Yeah, it's really interesting to me that the main moments where we see Lawrence either lose his temper or be what he thinks is unconscionably rude is when he perceives injustice to be done. So the first time I think he loses his temper is that, and I want to talk about this in like a different context later, but um, the moment where he's, so they've captured the French ship. He's taken the French captain's sword because apparently that is one of the intricate rituals that you do when you're Navy people who fight each other and one of them surrendered. And he makes a point of not giving the guy his sword back because he's looked around the ship and he's been like, okay, these people are really, half of these people are ill. There are not nearly as enough sailors on this ship to be sailing this ship. Mm. They've been wrecked up by that storm that we just passed through. He should have just surrendered immediately. He should have not, he should not have commanded his men to fight. He's not a young captain. This is an unforgivable error. And for that, I'm not going to give him his sword back like I normally would. Yeah. And it's worth noting that then they discover the dragon egg and then he goes, oh, now I get it. He really yeah, couldn't yeah, have yeah. anything different. Which like has parallels, I think, with like the final confrontation. So we should talk about that later. But where I was going with that was the like, that's when he's rude. He's like, 
You have led your men into battle when you shouldn't have, and you've cost them their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, and now I'm going to be rude to you. Or like, you're mean to your dragon, so now I'm going to be rude to you, you know? Another thing I really liked about his character was when he meets the female dragon captains. Mm. And so in the Navy, there are no women. And he just Mm. assumes that it's the same. And basically the most ferocious and dangerous of dragons Mm. only have female riders. So they have to have like female officers. And... I can't remember the phrase exactly, but it's kind of like he sort of mentally checks himself and he says yeah. that you can read that, you're reading his thoughts of where he's going, Oh, why did I assume there could be no women? That was silly. Like it, yeah. it you know, oh that's my preconceived notion. There are multiple moments of that in mm. the book where he goes like for example, so the the person in charge of Loch Lagan, the magical dragon Hogwarts, is a dragon. Yeah. And he's really shocked. And he's like he covers it. Like I think it, I, I think it's pretty clear that he handles it pretty well. And I think he's by mm. his own lights, he's as respectful to a superior officer as he would be to a human superior officer. Mm. But then he mentions to Temraire that their training master is going to be a dragon, mm-hmm. and it, Temraire is just like, well, of course, why not? Like Temraire, it doesn't even register for Temraire. And well, Temraire like, hasn't been spending his life in a society, or so far in a society mm. that puts puts about the idea that dragons are just dumb beasts that people use to do yeah. do fighting with. Or yeah. like, you know, and then Lawrence has had this sort of uh, belief, mm. completely challenged by the fact that Temera is obviously massively intelligent, probably more like, intelligent than him. Smarter than him, let's yeah. be honest. There are multiple yes. moments where he's like, why is my dragon so into maths? I can't I can't keep up with how into maths he is. He's explaining the Principia Mathematica to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do love that. He just goes, I'm going to go and learn Latin so I can explain it to him better. And then when he goes shopping in Edinburgh to go and mm. get some jewels, he also just buys all of these books to read to him, even though he hates yeah. it. He'll read it to his dragon because he loves the yeah. dragon, because he's the best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just oh, the best. But yeah, he's having this, this like moment of like shock. And then he's like, Oh, of course, like, why, he's ashamed of himself to realise that, like, he's gone, oh, of course, Temeraire is a person. And, like, the language he's used up until that point is, like, very much, like, he's committed to Temeraire. Temeraire is the most important part person in his life. Temeraire is an equal partner. Lawrence can never marry because he would never be able to give another person... Enough of himself. ...the right, like, as much commitment as he ought because he's already committed to Temeraire, which is just f***ing amazing. And he's had Temeraire, like, two weeks at this point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Temeraire's a yeah. baby at this point. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he's like, and he's like, oh, I've, I, I managed to understand that Temeraire is a person, and yet somehow it did not occur to me to extend that to every other dragon on earth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, and not only that is, it's kind of funny that Temeraire is mm. growing up, and so he gets like frills and lots of like Mm. as he grows older and they still can't quite work out what his quote-unquote special skill is you know some some you know dragons breathe fire or acid and i mean not not every dragon has one so it is plausible that temeraire might not just have one. yeah and and that's kind of what we believe through most of the book yeah they thought he was an imperial dragon which is like one of Am I correct in that? Is it in, was it Imperial Dragon? Yeah, they, they identified him as an Imperial Dragon at the beginning of the book, which is one of the two Chinese breeds, or one of two Chinese breeds that are incredibly rare, incredibly valuable. Yeah. And that explains why mm. the French ship was willing to fight so hard to keep hold of this egg. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's why it's so important to the Air Corps, because mm. they they end up having to do lots of training. Mm. in. And I loved reading about like their training formations and yeah. how... Temeraire, the one where the hamster, like basically they're doing laps and it's how long until they get exhausted. And Temeraire just keeps going and going yeah. and going and going and going and going. And just like, oh, I can do another one. I'm not really tired. I'll just do another one. It'd be fine. I'll just do another lap. <laughs> and all the other dragons like, are like, Lauren's long going, gone. is this not normal? I assumed all dragons could do that and yeah. everybody else is losing their goddamn minds. Yep. And Lawrence is just like, your dragon can't just hover in midair for no reason? weird yeah. I like, know. also the swimming like he's like oh yes. he's going for a swim and they're like i'm sorry you're doing a year what now and and then temeraire <laughs> yeah. goes for a swim and then all the other dragons uh, like they're like i want to go for a swim too yeah they all try baths oh it's so adorable they all go for a bath yeah there were, i think this this is brought up for me as something i wanted to talk about which is the kind of the way in which temeraire and lawrence are like bringing outsider perspectives to things because mm-hmm. and how well Lawrence handled and man. like nuanced that is in this book because like Lawrence coming from the navy is having to reevaluate a lot of his like 
I mean, he. I think he would argue he doesn't have prejudices and he would treat any man of the aerial corps as, as he would a member of the fellow armed forces and blah. And I'm not sure that's necessarily well, true. Well, he does have massive, massive hesitation about becoming one at the beginning in a way yeah, that is very yeah. much like, oh, I don't want to be one of them. It is very much like I wouldn't I wouldn't slag them off to their face and I would be I would be devastatingly rude to somebody who was like I I wouldn't stand for other people being rude about them to my face but I don't want to become them it's a miserable life and I think anybody who's belonged to a marginalized group can kind of relate to that a little mm-hmm. bit of the mm-hmm. like people being like oh well you're fine but like imagine if i was one of you sort it's of worth like, pointing out as yeah. well that by the end of the mm. book he is so much happier so much more secure in yeah. himself he has this incredible relationship with the dragon with temeraire um mm. and so at the beginning he's just like oh i wouldn't oh you know I, I can't imagine it. it's a miserable life and for him it is the life that he needs mm. yeah which is really lovely. Uh, the thing, other thing about bringing an outsider perspective, we do see a couple times throughout the book where his naval experiences is useful to the yeah. aerial core, or or the fact that he's still in touch with his crewmates on board the, the his former yes, crewmates on the yeah. Alliant, and he gets news from them. And so it's like we are we are sort of a, the sum of all of our history, and mm. it just because he has now become an aviator doesn't mean that he isn't also still yeah. a, a, a naval captain and some part of his mind. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's a two-way street, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. um, to say he can use those skills. It's like you know when you have transferable skills on a CV. Yeah, yeah I was a naval captain. Now I can yeah. be a dragon rider. Like I've got this. Yeah. Another really interesting <laughs> part is later on in the book, he has the chance to go back with some after he's done a couple aerial battles. Oh yes. He has the chance to go on back onto a ship to someone that he knew and fought with years ago yeah. mm. with another couple of dragon captains, and. And the social norms between the two groups are so different. And now he's on the other side of them. And he can see that the dragon captains are just trying to make conversation and, you know, talk about random things. And yeah. that the, the Navy people are finding it incredibly rude for what Lawrence now perceives to be mm. banal reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the the fact that this, this character has gone from being so firmly on one side of this divide to being completely mm. on the other is really yeah. interesting and really well done. Do yeah. you guys want to talk about that sort of, I say, the setup to that battle and mm. and that battle? Because I guess one of the things I guess that sort of upset me, I say upset me, was the mm. the mole who joined their group and originally was really uh, yeah. nice, and then I would, that made me sad. It was well done, but it made me sad. Yeah, yeah, it was well done, but also because I feel at that point uh, Captain Roland comes in, who I love. And yes, we find out that like this, this child that basically Lawrence has adopted onto one of Temeraire's sort of crew. Yeah. And it's I mean, it's Lawrence like a- is a good example of the Batman thing. Of, I am not a father figure, he says, as he trails his many, many adopted children behind him wherever he goes. <laughs> yeah, like he's kind of going, I will take all of you onto Temeraire. It's great. They got space. It's a big dragon. And then yeah. one of them's a, a a girl, and he's like, "Okay, yeah, you can come come too." And it turns out that this Emily's this girl's mother is a really high ranking rider of uh, what was the dragon called? Ixidium. There we go. That's one. And you also find out why they don't like um, evil guy. Rankin. There we go. That's the word. Sorry, my brain's <laughs> like why why they don't like Rankin is because Rankin had this he he inherited did he inherit the dragon yeah he inherited caleritas who was yeah. the master at arms at this training base yeah who is this incredible like old wise mm. powerful mm. dragon yeah. yeah and it, it's kind of because it, because i guess before that point lawrence had never really thought oh dragons outlive humans what happens when the human dies who takes oh the dragon god and next? he and roland have that conversation where she's like oh yeah. well you'll be wanting to get some strapping young ariel lass pregnant at some point the coral will be wanting to breed you too and every- he's just like holy he's like wtf is <laughs> happening right now he just completely loses it it's so funny she says to him yeah we we breed ourselves just as much as we breed them yeah, because yeah. dragons will want will take much better to a new captain once their old one dies if that new captain is a child of the old one. And it specifically mentioned sharing their grief, which I really like. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it's kind of it, it. It also kind of reminds like just because you're blood doesn't mean you're a good 
doesn't mean that you're up to the yes. same task. You know, nepotism yeah. doesn't work. So Rankin is like the son of a posh family and he's been slated to inherit this dragon, Caleritas. And Caleritas says something and we never really find out what actually happened between mm. the two. But after I couldn't bear him anymore. Yeah. yeah. Because Rankin basically treats his dragon like a dumb animal and he abuses him straight up like yeah. neglects him it's very like oh it's tough love you've got to like it's spare the rod beat the child kind of he needs to be able to be neglected because he might be neglected during war you know he needs to be used to harsh conditions yeah. because that's what he's for um yeah. yeah and everybody hates him for this and as soon as mm. lawrence figures out that this is who he, this guy is he hates him too yeah but there's this whole sort of i guess critique of the idea that dragon like all that the, the breeding and class mean you're going to be mm. a good person because yeah. at the end towards the end of the book there's a s- situation where so when when a dragon egg hatches you need somebody there asap to put the harness on it because there is a very 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 short window which a dragonette will let you harness it and so mm. caleritas is saying well we've got we've got a dragon down about an hour away or so that's about to hatch and like now that spoiler alert levitas dies and it's really 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 sad and rankin has to be strong-armed into going to like actually say goodbye to him as he dies like Mm. literally picked out of the bar anyway and caleritas Mm. is like well now rankin doesn't have a dragon and i don't have an excuse not to let him be the one to go and be the one to harness this dragon that's Mm. about to hatch what the hell are we gonna do um lawrence is like a dragon but we're better off dead than in his hands yeah yeah and he then recommends the one of the people who is temera's ground crew somebody who hasn't like who doesn't isn't like in he's not high born or anything yeah they are mm. like i think lenton asks him if he's a gentleman and lauren says not unless you mean he's a good <laughs> person <laughs> basically yeah not unless you mean he is a, a man of, of honor and yeah. like compassion and <laughs> yeah um and he basically says you should take this you should you should get this guy he should have yeah. a dragon. And Holland was the guy who was looking after Levitas. When exactly. he said, like, yeah. um, Levitas needs some friendly, like, company, Holland was the one to go and do it. And it yeah. was... Well, not only that, but tensions between Lawrence and Rankin means that every single person who cares for Levitas without Rankin's approval, which is anyone because he doesn't mm. care about Levitas, mm. is at severe risk of starting an incident between the two. Yeah. Like, Le- uh, Rankin basically bans anyone from giving a shit about levitas and and lawrence was kind of high up enough he could he could kind of he had to be officially told to stop yeah and so they yeah. keep doing it anyway but under pain of severe consequences to care for this dragon because he came in as a captain like he didn't go up the ranks they basically they like, gave his the same rank across effectively from the navy to the air corps he mm. he's not like an underling you know one of the ground crew trying to care for this dragon he's like okay well if like you say if i do it it might make mm. someone else do it because I'm I've got more to lose if I go against the grain and try and help this tiny dragon, mm. which is Yeah, I think we should talk about the like the whole sort of I mean, this is I mean, it's outside of perspective again, isn't it? But mm. I think it's one of the things I really appreciated th- about this book is how nuanced it is and how many levels that outside of perspective is happening on. Because mm. Some of the things that Lawrence brings into the aerial corps from the Navy are good, right? Like, he, he introduces them to, like, the idea that maybe you should clean your dragon after they eat. And it's no excuse not to, like, um, take the harness off them so they can sleep more comfortably just because it's more work for you and that kind of thing. So there's, mm. like, some shaking up that he's doing there. But at the same time, like, there are a bunch of moments where he's, he hates to admit it, but, like... He he's very grateful that in the aerial corps it's not standard practice to beat people when they f*** up. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, you know, and you're just like Lawrence. Lawrence, maybe consider that the navy was <laughs> actually. Uh- <laughs> well, and you see that when he has that that thing I mentioned earlier, where he goes mm. back to being on a boat, and it's just like, yeah, this is awful, actually. And it's kind of that's yeah. the boat where they're talking about the basically there's a big invasion, or there's going to be a big invasion mm. into the south of England, and they get information about this, and. Mm. Then he goes to the boat and has this discussion around this dinner table and he realises if he doesn't start a conversation that they're not going to talk to each other because, yeah, he can see the air corps people are trying. He's got used to their manner of speaking. But then Mm. he can also see it from the perspective of the Navy and they're like, why is this person talking to me? And they've got a ruffled shirt and they're not tidy and they're not in uniform and blah, 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 Well, it's not that. There's a specific specific rule that um, if you are invited to dine with the captain, mm. the captain has the right of conversation, I think is how they put it. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, like, okay. you're not allowed to have a conversation unless he started it. Right, right, right. 
But like, unless you were, unless you were an officer in the Navy, you never would have known. Like, the Aerial Corps aren't doing it to be rude. It just makes no sense to them that you'd, like, th- why would they know that rule? But all yeah. of these other captains are like looking down on them for trying to be friendly because they don't know this one bullshit rule that like, you know, it reminds me of that scene in Pride and Prejudice at Catherine de Bourgh's dinner table and with Lizzie Bennet it's not because she doesn't know it's because she doesn't care but where mm. Catherine de Bourgh is just asking all these rude questions and Lizzie's just being rude back yeah. yeah, and it's it's sort of like you know the done thing would have been to yeah. let her be steamrolled but like you know that's stupid yeah. and let's not do that actually yeah and Lawrence actually is like maybe I will just hold this whole conversation up with Chenery and nobody can stop me I think the, mm. one of the things I like about that what scene is that it ends with like one of the captains, the naval captains coming up to him and being like, well, I suppose it's good that we have the beast looking at Temeraire, but like, it's a damn shame to like, lose you in such a fashion. Damn shame you have to be chained to such a life. And and Lawrence is like, how f- dare you? Yeah. Yeah. He basically implies that Lawrence's um, life is miserable now. And yeah. Lawrence is just like, actually, no. No, I have this Basically, giant dragon. Like, I think that's maybe the rudest we ever see him. Is he's just like well, he says he he like goes off on him. He says I don't I can't imagine how you thought such an address would be appropriate or something. Yeah, yeah. He like he proper goes off on him. Yeah, and yeah, it's just it's sort it's of the, the, the those tiny little mentions of he reads the book to Temeraire and he gives him like comfort and cleans him and like mm. looks after him. Yeah, but as a partner. And everyone else is looking at him going, why Why are you doing that? Should, should we be but doing that? But not the people in like, the aerial core. The aerial core totally understand. Yeah. and I do enjoy how they all react to it as well. They're all like, oh, Lawrence, now you've given them standards. But they do it. They're yeah, like, oh, yeah. my dragon has asked me to like clean him. So I will. Like now that they know it's a thing that they want, I'm going to do it. They sort of jokingly it. complain about Lawrence putting ideas into their heads. And it's just like, yeah, but it makes my dragon happy. So I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. I, one thing I do love is how Temeraire always asks for... Lawrence's war battles and then when he finally yeah. is in battle it's very short and he's like oh is that it? Is that it? Is <laughs> well, it okay, can we talk about the final battle because the final battle has mm-hmm. one of the coolest concepts I, I was I did not see this coming I knew there was something so like throughout the yeah. book we hear that Napoleon is up to something and nobody yeah. can tell what because nobody can get over like the lines to see what he's doing he's doing mm. something inland that requires a lot of dragons and nobody knows what it is and it turns out that what he's doing is building airships that dragons can carry over the channel so that he does not have to win a naval battle to get his troops across the channel into England. He can have them in giant, very light boats, essentially, that the dragons will carry. And that is such a cool plan. And it's just... This this whole thing of like how is he going to mobilize all of these dragons that he has like what how what can he possibly be thinking of doing well he can't come across the channel because he's we're we're wrecking his navy and it's like no these two things are related I did not pick up on this the first few times I read it and it was something that like really struck me this time so you know we were talking earlier about the the incident at the beginning where Lawrence is like he's deducing all this about the captain of the French ship that they take the egg from Mm -hmm. he's all like well he has no reason to have made this really stupid decision. Mm. that I can't respect because he's obviously like a sensible captain of many years and all, all of this other evidence you know I, it makes no sense and instead of going maybe there is another reason there is something that I'm missing that means mm-hmm. that this was a rational choice in this guy's mind yeah he goes oh well it's a I, 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 this is not explicit but I assume it's it's a little it's a kind of a a subconscious um, British superiority complex yeah. thing going on where he's like oh it's just the French being <laughs> Like, mm. I'll just, I won't, I won't inquire further into this mystery, right? He's just like, oh, maybe the French are just stupid sometimes. He just kind of takes it at face value. Yeah. yeah. And what really gets me is that the entire final battle is set up in the exact same way. So we have, so we've mentioned before that there was a traitor. There's a, there's a spy in their midst. And, um, and he lets on when they catch him that Napoleon is genuinely up to something. And he's very interested in the Dover Covert where they are stationed, um, you know, the first place that you would attack if you were invading, mm-hmm. right? They know mm-hmm. he's up to something. They know that he's he's busy with a bunch of dragons on the other side, right? They mm-hmm. hear the news about Trafalgar and how England has won at Trafalgar. And they're like, oh, yeah, Napoleon's such an idiot. He's like, his navy, he just doesn't understand how the Navy works. The British Navy is the best ever, blah, 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 blah. And it blah. was a diversion. Yeah, to yeah. draw because, out like, their the dragons. Thing is, so, like, they, well, they've said repeatedly that they know that Napoleon is smart, right? So they know Napoleon is smart. They know he's up to something. They have the evidence of their own spies 
to be like something is going on on the other side of the channel exactly where we'd expect it to if they were planning an invasion Mm -hmm. and the clincher somebody says it's weird that he didn't have that many dragons at trafalgar like we would have been in real trouble if there had been more dragons at trafalgar i wonder where all his dragons are and instead of going a smart man is up to something with all of his dragons they're like Oh, well. It's up to something hinky. What a mystery. Guess we'll never know. Time to get drunk. And it's like... Yeah. I'm sure this won't come back to bite us later. My dudes, did you learn nothing? Yeah. Yeah. And I I do love how, like, this huge, like, in actual history, this huge historic, like, naval battle. Yeah. Um, Completely overshadowed by the dragons. Completely overshadowed by the dragons. Like, it's a diversion. (laughs) Trafalgar's a diversion. That big thing in London, the big big pillar... It's a diversion, you know? We don't don't care about that. And and they have this big battle and Temeraire, it turns out Temeraire has this thing called a divine wind, which I have just decided is a shockwave. Yes, yeah, Yeah, that's what I thought it was. It's like he has a shockwave, which makes me very happy. And it's like that powerful. (laughs) It like wrecks these flying boat things. Yeah, because they're not very sturdy. They're only supposed to like survive across the uh, the channel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he single-handedly turns the tides of this invasion. What I also love, putting my stem hat on, if the uh, shockwave mm. is travelling faster <laughs> than the speed of sound, then like, surely... Did the relative velocity he's probably also going at least transonic. So, <laughs> you know, he's also a transonic dragon, which is very exciting. So the, him having this divine wind ability means mm. that the only dragons that have this are the Celestials, which is the other Chinese breed. And Celestials are super rare, super valuable. Only the Emperor and like close relatives of the Emperor of China are allowed to own them. And so yeah. the fact that... So it, it's... it's um, I, I don't think it's actually in Temeraire. I think it's in the first chapter of the next book, yeah. Throne of Jade, um, which is included in the back of the hard copy of Temeraire that I have. So obviously I read this. And yeah. it's it's basically stated in that that the Chinese, for whatever reason, were sending over this dragon egg, this celestial egg, to mm. be the personal dragon of Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah. the, the, mm. em- the emperor yeah. of, of France. And obviously then it was intercepted and he became, and Temeraire became Lawrence's dragon. Mm. Mm. But like, it's this, it, it's a really, really big deal that he is, he, like, Temeraire is the most, like, Mary Sue dragon, most important, most yeah. special dragon in the world, basically. <laughs> I tell and you it what is- it is, is that Lawrence is a horse girl. Yes. We've walked into the <laughs> yes. wrong genre. Lawrence is a horse girl. Well, this is what I'm the getting genre, from right? The, the reveal that Temeraire is a celestial felt completely in keeping with, like, the shape of the narrative. It's like, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's not that it's like predictable because there are twists. I actually didn't mm. see the the choice the, the 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 French traitor thing coming. No, I didn't yeah. either. But overall, it feels completely correct that Temeraire yeah. is is the most special little dragon boy in the whole world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's won the Grand National and he's defeated Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It doesn't feel trite or overplayed or anything. It's just like, yeah. oh yeah, of course, he is the most special little boy. The best bit mm. I felt at the end of this bit, because just before they have this big battle, um, mm. uh, Lawrence is trying to explain to Temeraire like, why people would go to the town and he's like, oh, can I go? <laughs> he has to explain sex workers to his 10 ton dragon. And he's like, no, they have, they're going to go and see sex workers. <laughs> and then the second thing, he's like, oh, are they going to listen to music? And Tamara's like, oh, I love to listen to music. Oh, that, is, so, the, that is the most adorable thing at the, end, at the ending of the book. At the end, basically, he all the all of the they're, they're very held in high regard there's this big party thrown for the aviators and all the dragons are outside and basically there's this music going on and all the people in the orchestra either he like divert, oh no it's by the aviators request so they basically yeah. put the musicians by the edge of the pavilion to entertain both the humans and the dragons but then the and all the dragons are just like <laughs> yeah. chin hands watching the musicians and just like, like loving it and, and yeah. they realized oh, so the dragons cute. love this and they were like having requests and yeah. realized that Oh, that the... Like, at one point, like, the first violinist of the orchestra has just walked off to teach the dragons about music. Yeah, and, like, <laughs> playing all different airs and stuff from different composers and talking about them. Um, as the evening <laughs> wore on and the dragons proved a more appreciative audience than the noisy crowd of society, <laughs> their fear was gradually overcome by their vanity. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, that's such a sweet ending that they were... Mm. Oh, it just I love made that. Me so yeah. happy, and and like at that same ball that's being like held in the aviator's honor, you do see Lawrence um, reconnect with some of the people who were so awful to him at the beginning of the book when he stopped by his parents' house and were so mm. snobby and like, oh, your life is over now because you're an aviator, and then 
the next time he sees them, he's like the hero of the hour, having been the captain of the dragon that single-handedly stopped the invasion. Yeah. And it's not this sort of triumphant, ha-ha, and then they were all falling over themselves to, you know, impress me or whatever. Mm. But it does. Re- it is a really nice illustration of the fact that he does not value these people at all anymore, and he is happy yeah. where he is. And he goes back to his aviator pals, and it's just like, oh, thank God I don't have to deal with them anymore. Yeah. yeah. And then eventually goes back to Temera and it's just like, instead of going to sleep with his girlfriend, he's like, Temera, can I just stay with you tonight? She'll yeah. understand. She's a dragon captain too. And they just they just hang out. And I yeah. love that. So, I love yeah. it. I mean, I say that about the cat, you know. I'm just like, I'm just going to hang out with Gothmog tonight, you know? Just yeah. hang out, have some quality time with my best girl. <laughs> I mean, segueing into Gothmog's mm-hmm. review, what do you think she would give it? I think she'd very highly because she is a little dragon. I think a 10. I'm going to argue for a 10. I have been plumping for a 10 for this for ages mm-hmm. because there are, there are so, this is the first actual cat we've had. I will, I will die on the hill that Temera is the first actual cat in a book <laughs> yeah, that we've I read for this agree. podcast. I think that was I my can... first message to you yesterday. I was like, oh, I love Temera. He's just a big cat who wants to breathe fire. I yeah. mean, I think my first note, that literally my first note of my mm. of my notes as I'm reading it is, dragon is like a cat, so... Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a moment, isn't that really early, where he, like, falls out of the hammock and then pretends yeah. he hasn't? Yeah. And that is the most cat thing I've ever seen in my life. It reminds me of in How to Train Your Dragon, they modelled Toothless's movements off a, off a cat. Yes. Which, which uh, given that we have a black cat, you really see that sometimes in, in yeah. her movements. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I would argue for a 10 in this book, there's crime there's daring there's clambering around there's lots <laughs> of um dragons eating animals um yeah. which i feel lots like of she violence would lots of stabbing lots of guts mm-hmm. there's betrayal you know mm-hmm. and there's people making of big fusses of their overgrown cat friends mm-hmm. and yeah. buying them lots of shiny things for them to have and own and, and hoard i mean my personal rating would also be like 15 out of 10 i love this <laughs> so good it's so I, um, good so I read this yesterday morning and I mm. had to be like, well, no, I need to stop. I need to stop and like marinate in this for a little bit and record the podcast before moving on to the other books in this series because <laughs> See, I'm, I got I'm them, just going to I got them on them. Kindle, right? Uh-huh. And the first one was like 99p and the second one was like 199 or something. I basically got like in the space of two weeks, I got to like halfway through book five uh-huh. without really <laughs> stopping to breathe because I was just like, I was having such a good time. I was just like... Nobody's going to stop this party. I'm just going to keep going until I get to the end. It's fine. Absolutely. I, that's what I plan to do. I might reread Temera first, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. And I can confirm it bears rereading. Yeah. I was going to say, what else have you been reading apart from Temera on loop mm-hmm. perpetually? <laughs> um, I'm still on Marie Kondo uh, as well. Um, and I'm going to get back into reading that that End Times book that I mentioned like 10 episodes ago on this podcast (laughs) about the various ways that the world could end because that's kind of the headspace I'm in right now. Fun times. Mm -hmm. Um, But probably I'm about to, yeah, finish this series because it's amazing. It's really good. (laughs) How about you, Em? Oh, I just finished um, Clouds of Witness, which is the second Lord Peter Whimsy mystery, um, which I actually did because I started listening to As My Whimsy Takes Me, which is a whimsy-based podcast, literary podcast. Excellent. Hi, guys. And... I really enjoyed it. It's always a good time. A whimsy is always a good time. <laughs> and I just started um, The Care and Feeding of Was- Waspish Widows by Olivia Waite, which is like, it's not the sequel, but it, it features characters from A Lady's Guide to Celestial Mechanics, which is a historical romance, historical lesbian romance, well, Wooloo uh, romance, featuring lady astronomers and artists and just lots of women being badass and queer. Um so I'm very excited to uh, read this next one and um, get more of that. Um, but yeah, that's me. How about Lottie? I finished Rhythm of War. I read it in about... Uh, <laughs> this book is over a thousand pages long and I read it in about two weeks. Two and a half <laughs> weeks. Um, Excellent. And thankfully it got delivered to me just before lockdown number infinity and um <laughs> i just sat down and had to read it because my sibling was like you gotta read it you gotta read it you gotta read it so we can talk about <laughs> it and i finally finished it and it was amazing and yeah i'm i'm uh, yeah it makes me excited for like some like long-term podcasting that's like hopefully we read way of kings <laughs> and eventually get to it because there's just oh it it made me so well, happy, but yeah, it's again, it's it's a heck of a read, and I probably need to reread it again and again and again just to get all the nuance. But mm-hmm. yeah, speaking of uh, long term podcast plans, next week we will be reading The Hobbit, 
And on that episode, we will be joined by Rowan, our audio editor, Woo! for their first speaking appearance on this podcast. Woo! Which is very exciting. Um, and I'm <laughs> really looking forward to that because I love Tolkien and I can talk about it for hours. So I've it's great that we're going to be so doing that. Many questions because I watched the films the other day and I'm like, I'm gonna, I've, I've literally oh got the questions to ask. Oh boy. Should, should I divide them up? Because, dear listeners, this is going to be a two parter because we just mm. know that we are that much of nerds about The Hobbit that we're going to need two full episodes. Oh, may I May I respectfully suggest we reserve one episode for yelling about the adaptation? And yeah, one we'll that is adaptation that. We'll free that. as much as yes, possible. Definitely, yeah. definitely. But yeah, um, thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. Please like, subscribe. And if you are able to give us a review on your podcast platform, uh, Apple Podcasts or Podcast Addict, please do. You can add us on all our social media pages. They're linked in the description box below. And they're also all on our website. And if you want to send us an email, recommend us some books, teachingmycattoread at gmail.com. Add hello there in the subject so we know you're not spam. So yeah, say hello, big virtual hugs, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. So we're recording this a little bit later because we realised that we did not say all of the things that we wanted to say about this awesome book. And we're actually going to do another episode on it. So look out for um, Temeraire 2, The Temeraire Inning. Uh, <laughs> next next time when we talk about all the things that we wanted to talk about this episode and may even have mentioned in this episode and then didn't get around to talking about properly and we're really excited to to record that because in case we didn't say it enough this episode this book is awesome <laughs> yeah we loved it yeah absolutely other than that we'd like to say thank you very much for listening and it's goodbye from us bye bye, bye.